like and post and we're going to repost stuff for you guys. We're just small, but we just think it's really important for people to see the series because we know it's going to be fabulous anyhow, but it's just, it's, a, it's really fantastic to have this for our young people as well, to have these stories of Canadians, Black Canadians that, it, that we never grew up with. It's just so significant. Okay, so we are live. Just, we're going to start maybe in one minute or so, just to bring us right over at seven. Uh, sorry, just uh, before you guys go live, Marsha, test yes. one, two. Can you hear me? Can you talk? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Perfect. That mic, new mic is uh, working off in spades. Okay, great. All right, guys. Uh, Marsha, Charles, and uh, um, Arnold, are you guys good? Yes. Yes. Cool. yes. Have a good chat. Thank you for doing this. Uh, thank you, Aliyah and Natasha, for having them and us uh, and everyone else. Uh, please uh, have a good chat. And I also look forward to seeing your stuff on Global. You didn't hear that from me because I'm from <laughs> CBC. So. No, we're live. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Right, right. Off record. Okay. Anyways, have a good chat. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. You, okay, Ali, I think you have to, are we switched over? I think we have to uh, be able to show our cameras, get permission to show our cameras so we can get started. You got to enable that for everyone. Sorry, did you say that we all have to go on camera now? Yeah, or what's what was that? Yeah, I think I don't think we can. I think no. they, have to enable us. They, they have to enable it. They are the enablers. Oh, I <laughs> thank goodness. Hmm. <laughs> Sweet. Get some water. Or something. I do. I have a small glass there. I did take some. Okay, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to start in about a minute. Okay, so just stay tuned. We'll be starting shortly. Okay, just working out our, okay, connections. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining the Ontario Black History Society this evening for this panel conversation on new uh, film productions on Black Canada. I'm so excited to, um, that you were able to join us this evening. I wanted to thank you on behalf of our board and our staff. Our, this is our first speakers event for Black History Month 2022. Um, and so we're glad that uh, you can join us. Um, our panel, as I said, this evening includes producers and actors on three new productions, which I can't wait to watch. I'm so excited to have this group of uh, Black creators with us this evening. These, pro these projects are building on the repertoire of Black Canadian cultural productions, film specifically. Um, there's a long and growing body of Black Canadian documentaries and shows. 
These productions are a form of storytelling, digital storytelling. They contribute to the documentation of Black Canadian experiences as well in a way that centers Black people, Black lives, Black voices, Black thoughts. They are more than a technical production. I see them as important tools that help Black youth, Black people make sense of their experiences in this nation that we call Canada. They locate African people on this landscape. They evoke and pay homage to our ancestors. They educate. And I'm looking forward to sharing some of these in the classes that I teach as well. I was so honored to be part of Black origin story to share just a little bit of that complicated nuanced history of African people um, that I'm sure we, I mean, I, I just can't imagine how we can tell all of this wealth of stories in, you know, in a few parts of a, of a documentary series, but um, it is, you know, it's, it's, I'm looking forward to seeing that. And again, for me as someone who uh, does the kind of work that I do to be able to lend my voice and just some of my knowledge to that really for me uh, has been an honor. I'm so excited about tonight's conversation and thank you all once again, panelists, for joining us. I'm also excited to have Huda Hassan join us as our moderator this evening. Um, you know, just be, sometimes, you know, especially over the past few years, uh, we encounter people in the community, but online or on Twitter, not necessarily in person, um, but it's been great to still engage and interact and lift up all of the work that you do. Um, and I'm so, I'm so glad that Huda is able to join us this evening to facilitate this conversation. Uh, Huda is a writer and a cultural critic her writing has appeared in many uh, publications, including CBC, Pitchfork, uh, The Fader, ID Magazine, Quill and Choir, and BuzzFeed. Focusing on art and culture reporting, Huda examines the connections between art, placemaking, and power. In 2017, Flair Magazine named Huda as a writer to watch. She's currently completing her PhD in Black Feminist and Cultural Studies at the University of Toronto. Her research examines constructions of African Muslims in the Canadian cultural imaginary. Huda was born in Malvern, Scarborough, and still lives in the borough. Um, so thank you so much to Huda. And just before I turn it over to you, um, I, I, I did also want to just touch on the fact that for people like I can say myself, and I think I could speak for Huda, um, those of us who you know were born here um, to immigrant parents, uh, the way that we had to navigate making sense of um, and understanding and embracing our you know our cultures and histories of our families, but also making sense and navigating the space um, uh, that and the ways that that has shaped the work that we do um, and that the work that you all have done has contributed and will continue to contribute to that. So I just wanted to say that um, before I turn it over to Huda. Asha, for your really wonderful and kind introduction. Uh, thank you to everyone who's here today, especially to our panelists. I'm really excited to be engaging in a conversation with you all and hearing so much or hearing more about your expertise and your knowledge and what you have to offer us through these wonderful projects that are coming out very soon. Um, I want to especially thank Natasha Henry, Jada Wright, and all the organizers at uh, Ontario Black History Society, OBHS. For folks uh, who are new today or haven't experienced uh, this collective, um, OBHS is a registered Cave Canadian charity uh, dedicated to the study, preservation, and promotion of Black history and heritage here in Canada. I also want to say thank you to our audience and folks who are taking their time on their Wednesday evening to join us. It is an honor. Before we in, uh, begin our discussion, I wanted to quickly give an introduction of the three major works that we'll be talking about today, which is uh, Black, an origin story, um, the porter, as well as subjects of desire. 
So we'll start off with Jennifer Holness and Sud Sutherland's new project, which I'm really excited for, Black and Origin Story, is a four part documentary series or docu docuseries that looks beyond the Underground Railroad to explore the untold stories of Black Canadians from the 1600s to the present. These four hours are aimed to show that Black history is Canadian history. Let's watch the trailer for this. You got one, I promise you. <laughs> I don't want to play them if someone, I thought Alia would be playing the video. Mm. Yeah, just one moment. I was just assuring people that no, no, we, we, we did come with a trailer. <laughs> okay, here it is. Nope. Oh. <laughs> When people talk about there's two founding peoples, two founding European peoples, uh-uh, you've got some African people in there too. 10% of them were black. One time, I was giving a talk about slavery in Canada. This woman jumped up, just incensed. How dare you speak about us as if we were the same as the Americans? The rest of the world knows nothing about Canadian slavery because we at home know nothing about Canadian slavery. The segregation we experienced in this nation was very much akin to what happened in the USA. The government of South Africa looked at Canada to figure out how to oppress the native population of South Africa better. The first part of the plan was the building of the viaduct right on top of Hogan's Alley. Our ancestors weren't allowed to go to schools in the neighboring white communities. So our ancestors had to build those schools themselves. There are these huge omissions that really color your sense of history, a sense of who belongs and a sense of who has always been here. My family have been in Canada since 1798, so I'm a seventh generation Canadian. Even those who don't disbelieve will often say, why do you need to talk about this? It's painful, it's hurtful. I think every generation needs to come to its own terms with human injustice. We are standing on the shoulders of some of the bravest people to have ever lived on this planet. So I'm extremely excited to see this new piece that really complicates what the origin story, the beginning story of Canada. The Porter is another piece that we'll be discussing today, created by Arnold Pinna, uh, an executive produced by Marcia Green and Charles Officer, all of whom are with us today. I, I, have, to, I have to stop you there. Co-created by Arnold Pinnock, <laughs> Bruce Ramsey, Marcia Green, and Marie, we we are we are co-creators. My mistake. Co-creators. Yeah. My apologies for that. So the Porter is set in the early 1920s and inspired by real events. The follow or the Porter follows train porters Junior Massey, Zeki uh, Garrett, Junior's wife Marlene, and upstate uh, upstart performer Lucy, as a tragedy in the community sets them on starkly different paths to a better life. While Junior takes advantage of a broken system to pursue money and power and gambling and bootlegging, Zeki fights the railway to change the system from within by unionizing the Black quarters. Marlene questions whether her work as a Black cross nurse is truly serving her community, while Lucy takes her su success into her own hands, whatever the cost. As each pursues their goals, their, one, their once unbreakable bonds are stretched to their limits. Will they need to betray each other and their community to make their dreams reality? Mm -hmm. Let's watch the trailer for that one. First thing, shoes are important. No scuffs, perfect polish. And when you walk, walk like a man with answers because whether or not you have them, that's who you have to be. If anyone's got a right to that stage, it's me. Well, you think I'm out front just because I'm creaming your coffee? Try a little talent. Zeke, can you make sure that my husband stays out of trouble tonight? Don't I always. You think I need a partner? I think you need a man that knows every van in them trains. What makes you think you'll even make it to the door? I have been called the most dangerous Negro in America. <laughs> if I wanted to get the porters into a union, what's the first thing I should do? 
great fear of the white worker is that our elevation means their elimination. We are supposed to create our own opportunities. There are rules to be obeyed, Marlene, and I strongly suggest you start playing yours. When I hear somebody trying to sell me on a better life, I gotta ask myself, what is so bad about the life they got? I know y'all might be scared of what might happen if we do this, but maybe it's time we start thinking about what happens if we don't. You sure you don't want to work with me? You don't want to join the movement? Oh, I'm good. The force of our oppression is the truest measure of our power. No one to be a bull-headed Negro motherfucker. And we're not to be. I'm a poor Tapapsi, the most invisible man on the earth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tremendously excited for that one. I, I I love that you you can you can pick up the mixture of the Canadian and American cast on there. Uh, Muna Troy, I believe her last name is, who plays Marlene. I've recognized her from pieces here as well as Queenie's character. I'm I'm tremendously excited for the work. Our Thank third you. piece that we'll be discussing today is subjects of desire a thought-provoking feature documentary that examines the cultural shift in beauty standards uh, towards embracing Black aesthetics and features. The film deconstructs what we understand about race and the power behind beauty. Let's watch that trailer. Any woman's road is easier if she's beautiful. The way I look. I think any woman's road is easier if she's beautiful. The way I look has helped me in my life, but even my beauty doesn't change that I'm black. The most disrespected person in America is the black woman. The most unprotected person in America is the black woman. What I love about this Black America pageant is it creates a space for us to continue to celebrate Black beauty unapologetically. I wanted to be a part of the Miss Black America pageant. I needed to feel as though I mattered and my voice mattered. Little white kids would always comment on your hair, oh, it's so big, you look like a lion, you know, like you look like an animal. No one else says that to anybody else. In the realm of beauty, Black has to be minimized. People tell me, all right, when are you going to straighten your hair? Your hair, your hair, your hair. When you don't love yourself, you don't love anything. There are only three models for what a black woman can be. Somebody's caretaker or maid, this over-sexualized video girl, or they're the angry black woman. We're more than that. In a global world, we are moving towards a very different mixed ideal. What's considered ghetto is now popular. The history of race is such a painful one. But then to just be like, I like the way this looks. It's so dismissive. I can make you are you. This concept of beauty was being applied to me, but I never believed I needed to look that way. To be beautiful, to be great, to be excellent. This is what everybody comes to see anyway. Let's keep embracing that beauty. Us. Because it's always been here and it ain't going away. Cause I am me. You are your I am black. I am beautiful. Subjects of Desire came out in 2021 last year, November at TIFF. It is by Jennifer Holness. It is a wonderful piece, and I'm excited to talk about it today alongside Porter and Black and Origin Story. So today, uh, what we're aiming to do is to have a fruitful conversation about these pieces while also dissecting uh, Black Canadian film here in Canada and what the canon looks like, what it offers its audiences and what the future of Black Canadian film looks like here too. For today's discussion, we are joined by some of the, the brilliant creators of these projects, um, Jennifer Holness, Ar Arnold Pinnock, Marcia Green, Charles Officer. Thank you guys so much for having us or to be joining us today. Uh, Sutherland. Sutherland. <laughs> <laughs> After 5 p.m., I apologize. <laughs> and Sutherland was extremely important to this project, too. 
Um, can you let us know who each of you are and how you arrived at the work that you're doing now? Maybe we can start with Arnold. <laughs> oh. um, well, I've been an actor uh, in Canada for, uh, my God, 35, 36 years. Uh, very, very blessed. Um, and, uh, but I come from a line of storytellers. You know, I can remember as a young kid being at the top of the railing with my cousins peering through as downstairs, my mom and dad, and my uncles and aunts are all talking about what the dopey come from, you know, Bago and come down here or Moss Reynolds come with a whole bucket of apples and this and that. And sometimes I was, we were scared. Sometimes we laughed. Sometimes the drama, sometimes it was so tense. But as you get old, you realize I'm from that lineage of storytelling. And um, that may not be the mainstream of how one would perceive storytelling, but it is. And um, once I, I um, for me personally, once I, I took that on and realized that that was precious and that um, uh, I, I wanted to continue on that, that type of uh, storytelling. And um, so that's where I, I'm coming from in, in the sense of um, using my platform and my artistry and my lineage to continue on uh, telling stories such as the Porter. Thank you. What about yourself, Charles Officer? How did your arrival at the work that you're doing now begin? Right. Um, uh, the long, the long way. <laughs> How did I arrive? Um, yeah, like I, I, you know, it was, it wasn't something that was completely on my radar, but very similar to what Arnold ex, um, described is that, is that, you know, from an early age, you are absorbing those elders around you and these outrageous stories and experiences. And, um, but I surely did not know that I was going to be in this place doing what I'm doing today, even when I was 20. So I played hockey, I was, I went to art school, I, I, I um, was exposed to uh, a bit of acting and, 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 and the very interesting thing um, right here on this uh, Zoom is, is probably the, is the first producer, second producer I ever spoke to about making my first short film. The first person I spoke to was uh, Karen King at the NFB, and she suggested that I get in touch with a woman by the name of Jennifer Holness. And there's a there's this this uh, her partner is is uh, Sud Sutherland and 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 stuff and and uh, and I remember reaching out to Jennifer with this six page script and and asked her if what she thought of it and and. Uh, and if she would help me to make it, I think I said, and I remember I was working as a graphic designer. It was like on my lunch calling her. Uh, and, uh, and I remember she said, so when do you think you want to make this film? And I said, uh, in two months. <laughs> <laughs> I said something outrageous. And, and she was so beautiful and elegant and grace, gracious and just said that, well, you know, I don't think that's, that's enough time for me to get involved. And flash forward, I ended up making that film a year and a half later. <laughs> and that was my first film. And it went to TIFF. And then it opened up this space to the Canadian Film Center. And, uh, and I kind of got my, uh, my feet wet in a completely foreign world that I had no clue where I was going, what, I was, what, I was, what, what this whole mechanism was but it was so foreign, but I knew that uh, I had some sort of pull towards um, visual storytelling or experiences, something emotional that I was pulling me to this, in this direction. So I followed it and I've listened to it and here I am. Do you mind, us ask, or mind me asking what piece that first one was? Was it when? It was, it was a film called When Morning Comes and it was very personal, it was very heavy. I can't, yeah, it was very, very heavy, <laughs> emotionally heavy, <laughs> um, personal experiences. So, uh, yeah, and somehow that that uh, that kind of unleashed something in, inside of me. Catharsis. 
<laughs> it's incredible to know that there's collaboration that's happened here from from the jump for for, for some time. Um, Jennifer Holness, how did your arrival at this work begin? Um, well, uh, uh, thank you uh, for uh, moderating this panel. And I have to say that I have to say that when Charles reached out to me, I was in fact a very young producer and I am I'm completely self-taught because I um, did not go to film school or any of those kinds of things. That what actually happened is that I was a kid that wrote and was sort of, in, I had my own point of view, very unique, I suppose, in my family, but it's a Caribbean family. So they have no context or language for film and television or even creative. They were like, what is, what is she writing? What is wrong with her? And, um, and so I went to York University where I met this guy and um, he was in film studies and because of him, I after I graduated with this policy analysis degree, I said, yeah, no, mom, I'm not going to go to law school. Um, I'm going to become a filmmaker. And she was like, what's that? Um, so um, and then when Charles reached out to me, um, I, we were pregnant with our first daughter. And uh, <laughs> and perfect. so a part of it was like, well, um, I, I can't uh, do, I, I actually told him I loved the script and I thought it was very beautiful, but it would be not be something that I could do in two months. And also that I was, you know, like, and I, I don't know if I shared with you that I was pregnant, but we were, I and mean, we were on the verge of moving to a, an actual house. Um, so, but my, um, I think I told you a little bit about my journey anyhow, but really what it is, is that um, when I did enter the business, um, uh, you know, I had, like you guys, I think like both of you in some ways, I had, I had no um, mentors, I had no, we had no relationships with people that could help us or get us in. Um, we literally had to figure everything out ourselves. And um, I started uh, small, um, producing music videos. Um, and I think the first one we did together, which was Suds, it was nominated for like a best music video of the year kind of a thing. And then I did um, maybe about 15 more of those where I learned, but I, again, zero experience here, but people kept coming back. So I guess I did well. And then we, um, we, we in doing this though, we figured out the film industry, you have to have a short film and then you got to, to get a feature and then that's going to set your career. And so um, we, we, we decided to make a bunch of short films and we did a bunch of them. And then one of them was just incredible. And Sus could talk about it because it was his and it really did really well for us. And, and then once we, we did that short film, I knew that there was no way I could produce a feature because I didn't know anybody who would green light us. So I went to the film center. So I, I submitted my, my our, you know, my name to, to go into the film center as a producer. So that was my first training in the, in the film industry. But by the time that happened, we were actually in the middle of producing our first professional documentary documentary um that would be here on cbc and so it was it was kind of an interesting thing so so um that's how i got started and it was primarily the producer although we we wrote together and then um because i had always written i shifted into writing because that was really a big part of my passion um and suds was an incredible partner allowed that to you know he, he wasn't like what the fuck he just got produced for me no um and 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 you know um and then uh, and then um you know uh i directed a documentary uh, with suds uh in 99 2000 love documentary filmmaking it's actually my favorite medium for me personally as an artist and um and though i had three kids and couldn't really pursue that in a real significant way and so uh, in 2017, 2018, um, our show got canceled by CBC. And, uh, and I thought, you know what, I, I, I can do whatever I want. And, um, and I decided to make Subjects of Desire. And so that's how that came about. And, uh, and so, and then of course, the doc series and so can talk more about that stuff. But yeah, but that's kind of like my, that's my origin story. <laughs> So that's, we got a bit of your story as well too, but I would love to hear from you. What 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 made you even enroll in film at York? What made you uh, arrive to this tradition or this medium of expressing yourself? I was always writing like short stories and like always always plays and stuff uh, in like elementary school, high school, and then everybody was like, well, "What are you writing that for? What are you writing that for?" And I was like, "I 
I'm just writing just because I want to write. And so that was something I, I enjoyed writing, enjoyed sort of expressing myself. And people read them and, and they would, you know, like them. And, and that feedback was great. And then I was trying to be an actor like these guys. And um, I was trying to get on. I, was, I went to Woburn. Uh, and so, yeah, I went to Woburn. And uh, <laughs> so I was trying to get on a stage. And then, like, it was like I was not get, I was get never make it. And then I was like, okay, I, I must be a crap actor. But then like Raisin in the Sun came on. I thought I was going to be in that play. And of course, didn't get in that play either. So I, um, I, I wrote I wrote my own play and I cast it all my friends. And, uh, and then I couldn't, I, I gave it to this director guy who's like the best director in the school. He's a white guy. And, and he said, um, and I asked him how it was, how, what, it, what was it like? He said, well, it was pretty good for a black play. And I was like, what black play what the it's a play it's just a play so i said you know, you know i'm a director myself and that's how i i, I became a director i actually wanted to just act and then uh after that uh it was in the we put it in a series festival of drama i don't know if you guys remember that uh, but the series festival of high school drama and then it you know it's like a playoff and so it did well and then that early success encouraged me you know to 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 continue this and then so i went to york university uh for film uh film and video uh production and that's where i met jennifer uh she was in you know public policy administration and then after that uh we just started making uh you know shorts out of uh you know small production company making short films micro short films like five minutes six minutes seven minutes and then we made a half an hour short film called my father's hands and that won the hbo short film award and that's the first non-americans to ever win that prize and nobody's ever won it since and so nobody canadian nobody canadian not <laughs> non-american nobody yeah, yeah, yeah. nobody that was not american has won and so that really put us on the map and that really helped us uh, Jen, as she said, went to the film center and then that laid the groundwork for a lot of the relationships that we had to develop to create a feature, to get a feature film off the ground. And so we did a feature film called Love, Sex and Eating the Bones, which won Best First Feature at TIFF. And then that, again, put us on the map for more, more opportunities. And so it's been kind of like we've done docs, you know, comedy, drama, feature, <laughs> miniseries, TV. You know, we do kind of like whatever we, it doesn't matter what type, what's the envelope, but we just try to tell stories. Like Arnold said, you know, it's like, you just have this drive to tell stories because there's only so many films that we got inside of us and we have to get these stories down. And one of the things is one of the reasons why we love documentaries, talking to the, our elders and getting these stories down because it, once they pass, they're gone. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're definitely confronting that right now through the pandemic with all the losses that we've especially seen particularly in the arts and culture world, uh, with the loss of so many cultural critics specifically, um, I, I definitely understand that sentiment. I think that's something heavy for a lot of us right now. Marsha Green, the wonderful Marsha Green. <laughs> How did you arrive at the world of television and film? Um, well, like Charles, it kind of, it took me a long time. And also like everybody else, I, I really, I loved, reading as a kid. Um, we used to get in trouble for reading because we would read and do nothing else. Like I'd be like, I'm cleaning my room and I just like read a book and then my mom would come and then I would be like trying to like, I did something for the last hour. Um, but I, you know, I really just didn't think I could, I could do it for a living. I didn't think I could write creatively in this way, tell stories for a living. Um, and so I worked um, in advertising and marketing for like a long time. And then I would just write on the side for myself. And I did that for probably 10 years. And then, I don't know, I just was like, this is what I really want to do. And I felt like I couldn't give it up. That's what I felt that I had never really tried. And so I was kind of at this moment in my life where it was either like, this is what I was going to do, or I was going to start again. And I decided to start kind of from scratch and, and kind of build up this career. So I went to uh, Humber and took the television writing and producing program there, which kind of gives you an overview. I knew nothing about making television. I grew up in London, Ontario. There was like no industry there or anything. So I really didn't know anything about it. Uh, so I got kind of like a one year education there. And then I worked in production for maybe three years. 
Um, but as anybody who knows who's been in production, it takes over your life. And I worked so much that I didn't have any time to write anymore. And so I decided to kind of take another break, a reset, and I went to the Canadian Film Center and in their TV writing program. I mean, I knew quite early on that I wanted to be a television writer. Um, at least at that time, it was really my singular focus because I really loved being in a room with other people. And I just knew that, I just felt that that was like how I want, I like to write kind of with other people in that way. And then, you know, um, I think a, two years later, I was, um, I got to write my first episode of television and it was directed by Charles Officer. Um, and it was very exciting because I was really nervous and um, and Charles had done it a little bit before. So he had directed some television. So he's very uh, calm. And then um, I think two like kind of interesting things happened, I think, from that point to get us here. One was close to the end of us filming together. Charles told me about his friend Arnold and this project he had called The Porter. And this was like 2015. And he just told me about it. And I was like, oh, wow, like that should exist. And it wasn't really a question of me working on it. I just thought like that needs to exist. I'd never heard about the story and I just thought it was so important. And then the other thing that was kind of interesting was that Charles and I really enjoyed working together, but we were both kind of relative. I was very new. He was relatively new. He had done more than I had, but we were kind of like one day you know, we're going to work and one day we're going to get to a level where we can make something together. We'll both be, we won't be like working on other people's show. We'll have our own show that we'll get to make together. So by the time we got to this point of making the Porter and when um, Anne-Marie and I were asked to take it over and then Charles and RT came on, it just felt like, wow. It didn't actually, it, that was so about, what was that five years? Five years, not too bad. <laughs> we know, made when it. I, when I met Marsha, when I met Marsha, like on this set, <laughs> And honestly, like, I mean, we're working together for like maybe, I don't know, a month or so, like in, in its fullness. And, and I remember saying to her in five years, you're going to be a showrunner. Yeah. And I was and like, I, what are you talking about? That's like, not going to happen. Right. And she did it like in three. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, man. Like, called it. She just knew it. Like she <laughs> was, anyway, it's, it's just, it was, it was awesome. And to put it forward, I, I remember I'd, I'd met Charles. He introduced himself. I, I, I'm trying to remember if it was the, um, when um, Clement Virgo was either doing Norm Jewison or Spike Lee. And you came up to me, and I knew who Charles was, but you were so kind to me. I was a little like, oh, my goodness. And uh, when um, uh, Bruce Ramsey and I were, you know, we had like 16 pages of this thing called The Porter. And one of the people that I reached out to right away was Charles. So I was just listening to the Jennifer story about Charles do and doing it to you and, and paying it forward. And even at the time when, you know, it, you know, Charles couldn't get it done and he was working on other stuff, but he knew that he knew the story matter. And it was just the way that he encouraged us, you know, and at the time we were, we were looking for anything that were, was going to empower us. And um, we went to Harlem restaurant on the, the East end and we sat down and, and ate, and it's just the, 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 uh, this project was starting to become communal, you know? So it's, it's, it's kind of cool, the, the, the lineage. It grew like right out, like right across the country, right across, you know, the waters, right across the border. Like that's how it started from there. And like this community that's, that, that, that's, that we've connected with, like the folks in Winnipeg, you know, we got UK, we got we got Americans, you know, we got all across the board. <laughs> it's it was pretty pretty amazing what uh, uh, that spark that spark. But also too, it's it's of... so cool because you know when you're going after and pursuing these things, you you don't know sometimes what's going to inspire you, and it's like like a Charles officer or I remember I um. I went in to do an audition for Suds. I can't remember what the, the show was. And, you know, at first my mind was like, this is an American director. And it's like, no, he's Canadian. And I was like, I, I was, I mean, I was trying to give you everything I had in that room, man. Cause I, I felt so empowered that here is this black director sitting around and, you know, there were other producers there and stuff, but you were giving all the directions and stuff like that. And I just felt so empowered. I left that room going, 
okay, this is amazing, man. I, I, I've, I've seen it now and seen that it can be done. And it really, I don't know if you remember that, but oh, I, uh, I remember, I remember, but I also remember that you uh, got the part and <laughs> then you turned us down. <laughs> I was I was working on a a Whoopi Goldberg gig. <laughs> oh, he remembers. <laughs> I was um, I was blessed to be double booked that time, man, and I was, uh, I was good was problems. Good. good problems to have. That's amazing. So I have, I have a question for Marsha, Charles, and Arnold. Um, why was the show based on 20th century railway porters an important story to tell? Marsha, for a, one of your first, you know, one, a big project, but why was this an important story to tell about Black life in Canada? Why is this an important moment and narrative to reveal and share to the rest of well, this country and anyone watching? Um, I mean, I think what, at the time when I first heard about it, the reason why I felt like it should exist was actually because I felt there were a lot of um, period pieces at the time and and there was they did not have diverse casts and people would just be like, well, that was the time, you know, there were no black people. And it's like, but there were. And, and I was just like, but nobody's even looking for these stories. They're not looking for the stories that we're in. They're content to tell these stories where we don't happen to be in it or we're in the background of it. And so, to read about the porters to what like when you think about it if you like watch an old movie and you see the porters are there in the background of this of the story and so to get to be like on a scene that you would see like a train scene except we're in the porters pov we get to see what they see and be in their lives and these passengers are the background of their lives it's just so amazing to me so that was one thing that i thought that kind of carried from then to now. And then as we started to make it, I think what drew us most to it was that it's like this history that we don't know, but history of people who have accomplished amazing things, you know, that it isn't just a story about, you know, all of the things that the porters endured, you know, that's in there and that's part of it, you know, but it's actually a story about the porters and this community and everything that they overcame and fought for and like pushed past and they were creative and, you know, when the men couldn't, you know, make the union thing happen, the women came, they were like, we got this and then they did it, you know, there were just so many beautiful, amazing stories of the ways in which um, they triumphed. And so it became really nice to be telling that part of the story along with everything else. So that was for me, what really made me feel like it was a story we needed to hear now to hear the story, like our history, but a history of our triumphs that I think we don't get to hear very much. Thank you. Um, this could be for, for all of you guys, but why, what are the current gaps that you guys are feeling or noticing in Canadian television and film, particularly when it comes to Black narratives? Are, are, there, are there still existing gaps? Do you feel like these gaps have, gaps have been addressed in recent years? Oh, you're muted. What gaps? <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to Black narratives and even diverse narratives, it's all gaps. Um, I, I apologize for my, my facial expression, but I just, you know, um, I, I helped to, to, to found the, the Black Screen Office because I have been working in, 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 an, in an industry uh, that has completely um, historically denied our presence for the most part. And when we were giving uh, work, it was always meant to be um, uh, very, uh, got less money for the same work. Um, you know, uh, we were often the first to be let go. You know, uh, we got um, our, it was more difficult to find development. The reality is when we, um, when we looked at it, there were maybe um, six, fe six feature films made by black Canadians, um, you know, and I think- um, The history of cinema in this country. Is just in the, since it began. That's what people got to get through their heads. I'm Absolutely. sorry, I had to jump in there. It's like in the history of cinema existing on the on, on in our human existence in this country. Six. That's the number we have. And, 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 you, and, and you guys are two of them, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Crazy. Or between the yeah. two of you. 
Yes. You guys are living fossils, living fossils, man. Yeah, literally. <laughs> so it's been so disgraceful. And then in terms of series, and you have to understand, we have a system that is government funded. So that means that this is for all of us, right? This money is for all of us to create content. So then why has so little been done? So there are massive gaps. But I do think, um, and this is perhaps one of your questions to come, but I do think for me, it, it's, it's the history um, in that when I grew up, and I'm actually Caribbean born, I'm Jamaican. So let's just start here. Now, I did come here when I was six. So, but whatever. It doesn't matter. It's in you. Well, really, you. But here is the thing everybody made me, made sure I knew I was Jamaican. Everybody and everything there was, and, and when, I, and even for me to look to what a Black Canadian was, it was always an immigrant. And so I grew up feeling like there was no, that Black folks didn't significantly impact the foundation of what is Canada. That's how I grew up feeling, right? And so um, that is something that to me is very, um, uh, like it, it takes away from our young people as they try to navigate and, and, and grow up and, and feel a sense of, you know, of uh, community and, and who they are. All that takes away from us. There's no sense of place and space. So that actually is the reason why Suds and I decided to make BLK an origin story. Because as things were, you know, George Floyd was murdered and they discovered Black people in Canada. And when they discovered Black people in Canada, they discovered systemic racism in Canada. Thank you, George Floyd, for your sacrifice. Uh, because that was how this happened in Canada. We, let's be real here. And so with that discovery, there was a sense of like Black folks were being supported in a different way. But we chose, Suns and I, to do this documentary series because we uh, really grew up with the pain of being erased, the pain of not feeling, uh, you know, that you're part of the fabric of things. And so um, there are massive gaps. That's if that to answer your question. <laughs> it's perfect because I, I'd actually love to uh, ask you about the origin story. Why was it important for you and Suds to, you've already answered this, but I, I would love to hear more about it. Uh, why was it important for you to reorient what the origin story is uh, of Blackness here in Canada? Uh, why was that important for you to lay that out in, in a four hour docuseries? Uh, why was it important to do it the, the method that you did? We, we don't know our story. And the thing is, is that the world doesn't know our story because we don't know our story. And so we have to tell our story. We went across this country and then the, every instance, like we talked to people who, you know, lived through the 20th century, uh, the porters were everywhere, right? We talked about, and that wasn't the focus of our, in, by any stretch of the imagination, but they kept on coming up. So you'll see it in every documentary, every one of those hours. We have to tell these stories because like we are here, we were here, we've been here since the 1600s. You know, the fact is that there are 200 years of slavery on these lands, you know, uh, European slavery, you know, and the, that's the, that fact exists. And nobody, you know, people say that, oh, there was no slavery in Canada, we're Underground Railroad, that's it, we're abolitionists. Blah, blah. That's the, a 31 year history. We're, we're, that's what we're claiming, but we're not talking about the 200 years that preceded it. So we had to tell, we have to tell this story because people don't like, this is like new information for people. Like Natasha, president of the OBHS, we in, wanted to interview somebody from the OBHS and she's an authority on up, slavery in Upper Canada. So we went and asked her, okay, was there slavery in Upper Canada? Was it slavery in Canada? Yes, there was slavery in Canada. Like, I mean, she says it right and plain, right? We had to tell these stories because we weren't told these stories at school. You know, I have a lot of friends. I almost failed history myself. Reason why? Because it was taught poorly by people who actually didn't even know the history of Upper Camp because they didn't know the true history. So we want to give teachers these tools because we want them to teach our children properly. You know, but they don't even know these stories, to be honest. They don't even know them. So I have to echo on that because it it it, um, it, 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 it lies heavy on my on my heart. 
because for me, you know, it took a long time for this whole thing to, uh, for the Porta to happen. Um, but along the lines, I always say, you know, when I came to this country from England, my parents are from Jamaica via England to here. One of the things that I love to do was try to dig up these like treasure toes of black history so I could read to them so that they could understand that there were black Canadians here. And, and I'm talking about small little books that are about this thick, you know what I mean? And, uh, and I would read to them, but along the lines, what kept on coming up from time to time were these things called people called porters. And uh, I didn't know, and I didn't really know what a porter was other than the, you know, the, the movies that you saw in the, the United States. But until I found out about, and you know, Marsha and, and uh, Charles have heard this story a thousand times, so I apologize, but until I found out that these men and women that not only came from the South, but from these Caribbean islands, these small little Caribbean islands came here and changed policy. All the words that you're using woven into the very fabric of this country. Um, like that to me means a lot. And when, when um, I could share that with my, with my parents who are Jamaican descent, the pride that got into them. And when you talk about kids realizing and understanding, and that's just one story, understanding that they have stake in the very streets that they walk today, be it Spadina, uh, the war, Queen Street, you know, um, Regent Park, um, uh, in, in the sense of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. And one last thing I wanted to say, when I was watching the trailer for uh, your, your documentary, I almost broke down in tears because uh, when we were trying to get this show together, I was working on a show in Vancouver, going through a tough time because I didn't know if the show was going to happen. And I just happened to be staying at a, a condominium on, on Main Street. And I decided to go across the street to go have a beer. And I'm drinking my beer and I'm at the window and I look up and there's this sign on a pole. And it kind of looks like a porter on the sign. And I walked over there and there was a complete map of Hogan's Alley. Alley. <laughs> and um, oh yeah, uh, um, I didn't realize I was walking on black history. And when I heard about the viaduct and them bulldozing down this black neighborhood, I felt so bad because I didn't know about this history. But I took a picture of that map and I went to every location. I knocked on doors and I said, did you know that black people lived here? Did you know that this is um, um, Jimmy Hendrix's grandmother uh, had a chicken stand right here? And I felt a sense of pride. I called my brother that day and I said, Donald, I'm walking on Canadian black ancestors. Man. And they empowered me. They empowered me at that moment to continue on what I believe was a fight. So I just wanted to say, like, uh, I can't wait to watch this documentary, man. Um, we, we sometimes don't realize when we were going to get empowered by our Black ancestors, which Charles is consistently always says that. So um, God bless you both for this, man. Yeah, and God bless you as well. This, so your story is, is so beautiful. And it's, and yeah, because, you know, it, and it helped you, I'm sure, to keep the faith. And now here you are, you know, so, it's, it's meant to be. I believe everything that unfolds is what's supposed to do, happen, especially if we take an active part in them ha happening. So that's my belief. And just seeing that just, just tells me that absolutely. Yeah, what I loved seeing in the, that in your doc series is just like, you know, the Black Loyalist Museum and like people don't know this part of our history. It's like when I was making like, you know, the skin we're in, it's like that's what Desmond and I set out to do. It's like this is... The, you know, and I hate it. I didn't want to make a film. And he's like, dude, we, we got to do this. And, and because I'm like, I don't want to be talking about shit that I already know. <laughs> you know, it, it's just like this history. No one's really involved. Uh, you know, it came from my house where my mother in, instilled in me that to constantly read about our history, our, 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 our roots, our Jewish roots, our, our, our deep cultural African roots and our Canadian roots and where we came from and American Exodus, because a lot of our families, even like, you know, they come from the Caribbean, wherever small islands, some of us end up in America first before they come to Canada, you know, and, and, uh, and it always, 
you know, it speaks to how long this project um, took to get made. Like a lot of our projects take, again, um, you know, the, the twice as time when I think of Malcolm Gladwell talking about, you know, the 10,000 hours of stuff, it's like, when do we get our 10,000 hours? We, we, it takes us, you know, tw twice as long to get 10,000 hours because we don't actually get to put the time in. You know, I, I, I wrote a script about Africville 10 years ago. I went out after, like, I wrote like crazy. I was uh, writing about stories that I felt were critical for our, for us to, to see. And because as I get older, it's just like more years go by. It's, 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 it's feeding into the further erosion of our existence here. You know, the further it gets away from it, that, that people can say it's a myth or that there were like, you know, we invented the black hockey players invented the slap shot. They invented body checking in this sport. They were playing this game well before Lord Stanley had a cup. <laughs> like, you know, it was black people and, and Mi'kmaq and Mi'kmaq uh, indigenous people who were on the ice playing hockey together. You know, so these stories and this part of our, 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 our existence and, and, and we owe it to our ancestors to in every power that we have right now in these mediums to, to, to realize them and, and to uh, immortalize them because that's kind of what the medium does, you know, in this strange way, it's like, it's there in the archives. So I think that's uh, what we've all been kind of collectively doing in our own ways. And um, even it's just getting into position to basically hire a person of color that we really think are, are talented to just drop them into this system that we've so, so called penetrated. Um, it's it's uh, each one of those little movements. I think of of, of you know our, our little victories, but but we need more. It's an, it's an embarrassment that we have all this amazing, robust, beautiful, heartbreaking, victorious stories right here that that are that, and we're just scratching the surface. Like it's uh it's it's um so so it's uh the work is is. is there's a lot to still do, as <laughs> I was saying. <laughs> this is a question for all of you guys, and I, I'm, I'm mindful that some of you are actually part of this word that I'm, I'm about to use. Um, what is your first point of contact with the Black Canadian film canon, or what is your beginning of that of that canon? Again, noting noting that some of you are very much that well all of you are part of that canon but and define that canon in many ways but what what was that first point of contact for you are you calling us old <laughs> <laughs> i did not I, <laughs> I think like in terms of like the black canadian film canon i think it begins with william Greaves in the late 50s i believe that's where and his work with the national film board like that's where i believe it starts um, and I mean, that's in my studies, so I'm, that's a long time ago, but, um, <laughs> but that's where I believe it starts. But there's a lot of like, there's a lot of people who are, there are people who could, who were passing for black working at the CBC. There's like all kinds of people who are, you know, but in terms of our stories, they've been kind of few and far between and, you know, bits and bobs, like something will come up here. Oh, the national film board will have a film, you know, and, it, and, and CBC will do a report. Um, you know, like in our research, we find, oh, there's a spot news event talking about Dresden. And so like, we'll actually see Dresden, you know, Hugh Burnett talking about, you know, like why, uh, you know, integrating the, the restaurants there. So we'll see like a, a news feature or something, but in terms of actual African Canadian hands writing or, or producing or acting in or what have you, it's like, you know, it's, it's, we're now seeing more of this stuff because people are trying to actually write this down. But like for us coming up, even when I was a student at York, it was like, you'll see like a little bit here and a little bit there, but you wouldn't get it. Uh, the idea of canon is something that, I mean, you're, you're going to be the person cataloging it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and just, what I wanted to add to that was that, is that when we, when we were coming up, you know, um, we looked to America. So Spike Lee had, um, you know, a uh, hit in, in the U.S. And then there was Singleton and there was like Darnell Martin, who was an African-American um, and Hispanic woman. Um, and here's the thing. There was nothing in Canada. And then 
Clement, I actually felt like for me, um, again, not growing up um, in a thinking as film and television as a professional endeavor, um, that the, the work of, of Spike, it reinvigorated us all. It made us believe that this was a possibility for Black people. At least it did that for me. And then when I saw Clement and Damon, and, and you know, they inspired us incredibly so. I mean, Charles, when you got your short film done, for example, it was so inspiring. And I, because I, I, you know, I spoke to, I spoke about you to Suds, and I said to him, I met, you know, we did actually meet this young man, and uh, his story is so wonderful, and I really hope he gets done. And then it was like, look, he got it done. And but again, few and far in between. And Arnold, as a performer, again, it's the same thing, right? It's like um, because that's the other side of it, right? And you, you know, um, rarely featured, but you know, then you get like a, a a decent role, a really good role, but it never then led to any kind of you know, and, and that's that's been the experience here. But mm -hmm. thank God um, that uh, I guess like people like Claire Prieto and um, you know and Roger McTier, Roger McTier you know, you know, again, yeah. you know, even Clement, um, you know, um, you know, some of the young Clement, I mean, again, Clement came at like Clement, Stephen Williams. There's a wave. Yeah, Stephen Williams in, in the oh, yeah. Soul Survivor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah they, they came Come on. as a as a wave, right? And so. Yeah. We, as a, as, a, as a sort of new black wave that was, again, like there was an encouragement from Spike and then that kind of spread a little north. And then he, they, I know they inspired, uh, he inspired those guys. And know they, those guys inspired us. And so, but right. it's just that sort of thing sort of started happening. You mentioned Karen King as well, mm -hmm. Damon De Oliveira. So there's a lot of people who are like, you know, and again, like we're all now peers, but there's a lot of people now like, those are the names that sort of like, again, they were the ones paving the way, getting to the film center, making things happen, you know, and opening doors. And so it, it's a series of like people opening doors and then hey, some other people can get, get them, them doors, you know, RT's coming on now. So it's like, and, and, and we're, you know, producing his feature, you know, so it's like the, now all of these things are happening. Doors are opening, but we, we've been trying to open doors for, for a while now. <laughs> It's been it's been a minute. Yeah, I agree. For me, um, Clement Virgo definitely was my sense of inspiration. Not just uh, for someone who was behind the camera, but for seeing you know from being in front of the camera and seeing him. Steve Williams, the same thing. Um, just to seeing that these guys were paving the way and taking and jumping with two feet, and also hearing them talk to the powers that be. <laughs> you know, it was almost like uh, like a Sydney party in the heat of the night moment for me, you know, and uh, just really in inspirational. And, and uh, you notch those things down and, and you remember them when you're when you are dealing with those uh, trials and tribulations and trying to move your career and at least this project uh, forward. Uh, I just want to remind uh, folks who are watching, if you had any questions for our panelists today, I'm not the only one asking questions. I'm sure that you have a million of your own as well. So please feel free to submit them and we'll get to them at the end. Um, I'm going to be wrapping up some of my questions very soon, even though I have a million and one more questions for all of you guys. I kind of want to pick your brains more. Um, but we'll, we'll try to wrap up with one or, one or two more. Uh, we, we mentioned some of these names and I was actually thinking of this when I was trying to think of my own answer to what the black film canon is. Um, certainly not as informed as any of you, <laughs> but uh, one of the first names I did write down was Roger Gutierre and Claire Prieto. Um, oh my, uh, my arrival at their work was what introduced me or made me want to tap more into the black Canadian film canon. Um, and I oftentimes, I'm, I'm a writer, I'm not a filmmaker, but I do think about uh, the trajectory of their careers here in Canada, that one of them, Claire Prieto, relocated to the States and has, is, has been working there for some time. Um, and Roger Victor is here with us in Toronto, but I often do wonder if people are aware that they're walking amongst a legend when he is up in these streets. Um, so I my question for you is what, it's actually kind of a million questions. I'm gonna try to put it into one. Mm -hmm. 
what do you feel or what would you advise to the current filmmaker, the Black filmmaker here in Canada about the future of this field, what to look out for, what to be confident about, what not to overlook? Um, because when I think of Roger and Claire, my assumption is leave or stay here and risk, risk some things. Um, so what, what would be, what, what, what do you feel is the best, what, what would you advise to the current black filmmaker? Marsha should go. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard from her that much. I was like, oh, I hope when we run out of time before you get to me. Um, <laughs> You're uh, you know, television, I'm just going to say, you know, having worked in television since the beginning, um, what you know what one thing that i was really fortunate like when i started writing for television it was at a time where like i would have contracts that were very long like i would be on the show for like you know seven eight months or whatever and that has kind of become a thing of the past and so now writers get hired for very short contracts and they just don't get as much of an opportunity to learn the whole process like as I did from getting on being on these long long contracts so I think I would say just like as as an artist as a student of the of the like we are always like students of the medium you know you, you every project that you do you're learning something new and I think it's like really actually and it's become very incumbent on us to find those opportunities to say, you know, even if you're done the show to call your showrunner and say, could I come to editing with you? Could I just sit in for a week and see to learn? Because, you know, we want to have these opportunities and we're in a moment where, you know, many young um, or new writers um, of color are getting opportunities or getting their ideas heard or getting their shows and then they're getting, you know, paired with other people, but it's just it can be very overwhelming and we just haven't as uh, Jennifer was saying we just haven't had the education, you know, that like we and we haven't been around it very much and so we really have to try and find those opportunities. Um, create those opportunities for ourselves um, and uh, in terms of staying here versus going to the States. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to say. We're just in it. We're, you know, we're in a very interesting time, I think, for television, at least in Canada. And we won't really know, but we won't know for a little while uh, where that's going to go. Um, but, you know, there's so much talent here and there could be so much opportunity here. And it is kind of, again, like for those of us who are writers already, you know, it's up to us to like, you know, follow the policies and the bills and where they're going and and fight for the Cana for Canadian television like that's what it's gonna that's what it's really gonna take um and uh yeah and I'm gonna be doing so and I hope other people join me <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> you wanna? Well, I just want to say, um, people like Anthony Farrell, um, you know, who's a, a showrunner, fantastic, who um, went to the States and came back uh, working on shows like The Office, he makes sure to bring his BIPOC, his young BIPOC writers um, on set for their episodes that they write and, and to give them that experience. And in some cases, he's not even there. Because his goal, you know, is to have multiple uh, showrunners from the BIPOC community, not just one or two, but multiple. And once you get, I believe, showrunners um, at the stage of where Marsha and uh, Anne Marie are, then we can see, and Jennifer, uh, more and more uh, shows getting done. Because sometimes I find that that is almost like the loophole that stops us from uh, being able to, to tell us our stories. At least that's my experience. Um, I mean, obviously very blessed to have Marsha on the show and Anne-Marie as showrunners. We're very, very blessed. And, but um, I think it'd be cool if we had more Black showrunners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's... It's... Yeah. it's um, it's interesting. I think that it's, it's, 
and to young people, and it doesn't do a lot of stuff, a lot of comp talks and, and whatnot, universities, we've done that our whole career. But we said to them, this is the time to get into the industry because this is the first time I've seen that um, they're looking, they're seeking, they're looking for this talent in your that talent. And so um, I don't know where people have this idea that, um, you, you know, only one or two should be elevated. Nothing happens when you have one or two, nothing changes. You might personally be uh, okay, um, but the minute they change their mind or something, they decide to do something, you're gone. And I, you know, when I, I, um, I just recently, um, last year, I, I, I joined the CMPA as a board member and they had asked me um, maybe for five years before to, to be a part of the CMPA and I, and I said no. And I, and I said no, for one reason and one reason alone. I said no, because I refuse to be in another organization where I'm the only black person. It is, you can, it is demoralizing. It, you can, you accomplish so little. And the second someone has an alternative point of view or the second you have an alternative point of view, I should say, um, uh, there is no support. And so the institution is able to continue itself while looking like it's being diverse because they've got this one black person and this one Asian person. So I've come to a point in my life well before um, this new movement where I completely refuse to be in spaces where I'm, um, where I'm contributing and I'm the only one. I refuse to be in spaces where when they do things to undermine us as a group that I, I, don't, I do not stick around. I do not wait and see. I'm very clear. We have to take a stand. We have to be um, in this together. And so having more show, showrunners, um, bringing in new voices, it is absolutely what we must do. The problem is that historically we got so little funding, so little money, there was, there was so little to be done because you were barely surviving yourself, you know? And so the, the investment into us and our communities, we must um, take it and demand more. I mean, this is why, and Seth says, why are you so crazy with all your boring work? And, you know, um, um, you know and I, I, I uh, you're confusing as I assume they, but I, I, I think it's completely important because right now it is happening. Right now we're being funded. And so this is where we can bring, we can bring everybody in. You know, like we do little things like we got a little project going on and we said, hey, um, take part of our fee here so that we can bring a young person in um, and have them be in the room and just listening in. Like we're, we're, we're doing those kinds of things. You know, somebody said, oh, we're, this this young person wants to be mentored by you and so forth. And I'm like, I'm mentoring four people. I can't anymore, like in this year. Um, but you know, like this is what, this is what, this is how we run our business, right? And so this is a great time. More showrunners are needed, but more everything is needed. And we have to put our energies into developing them. We cannot be selfishly just moving through. Um, and this is why I love what, you know, Arnold, you bringing in all the team you have, but it's, it's something that we strive to do and it's been so hard. So it's great that we're finally in a position um, that we can demand more and get it. That's a dog. Beautifully said. <laughs> you know, this is being recorded, right? Yes. Okay, this needs to be transcribed <laughs> into like a how-to manual. <laughs> <laughs> this whole conversation. <laughs> oh, amazing. This, this kind of, there's a thread here, I think. There's an audience question. Um, what do you think the future of Black film in Canada will look like, especially with the rise of alternative media and the influx of streaming services? Um, so while you guys were speaking, I was actually thinking about um, CBC Gem. Um, uh, what's it called? Oh, I'm blanking. Right. My brain really does stop working after 5 p.m., sincerely. <laughs> <laughs> Next stop, the show that's based in, in, in Scarborough, uh, and it was created by Jabari Weeks. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Excellent show. I would honestly highly recommend watching that. But um, 
that that did get me thinking and I, I appreciate this question from the audience member what do you think the future of black film uh, and television in Canada looks like with these alternative media and infle the influx of streaming services? Because um, I think Jabari, you know, is, has been an example of something that has been motivating a lot of us, the younger folks, but I would love to hear what you guys think. I think the future, we, it's not just about the people who are creating the shows. Mm. It's about the gatekeepers. We need to have different gatekeepers because just as we're trying to get these shows off the ground we're seeing the same faces saying no nah, i'm not really interested that's not our audience our audience would be interested in that if those same people are just going to be still there then nothing's going to change yeah what one of the bright things about cbc that's happening now is you've got like you know you've got a new cast of characters right at least at the door, at the, at the, at the gate, they're, 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 they're there at the gate. So we need to get into the gate. Liam Barron. Liam Barron, you know, you've got some people now who like are interested in these stories and not just stories from the black community, but the stories from a diverse community. Yeah. So at, at this, at that particular place, but it's also have to happen at Chorus, got to happen at Shaw, got to happen all across the board. So the gatekeepers also must change. Now, and, and the funding bodies have to create funds for us. So we can say, okay, now, now we're getting in the door. Telefilm got to have a different, different makeup of people who are saying yes. So those things have to change because guess what? Our parents paid into this. Our parents paid their entire lives. They've been working their entire lives paying taxes. And so that has to be, I mean, it's all of our money, all of our money. So yeah, I mean, one of the few bright lights in Canadian film from the last few years is Achilles Escape. You know, stop, not a word of a lie. One of the few bright lights. It's been depressing, honestly, feature film in this country. It's been depressing, right? One of the few, and it's like one of the few people, like one of the few films to have anybody of color in it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's sad, you know? We have to do better because we got scripts. We got, we got, we got stories and we, we need to tell these stories. So the gatekeepers must change, you know, unless those things change, the future of Canadian film, black Canadian film is, 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 is going to be, is, is going to be like the present and or sort of just the recent past. So we have to change those things. So we need executives of talent. So, you know, we need people who are, you know, really good, you know, good writers, good critics, because we also have to have a, a, a critical base of people who are going to criticize, and not criticize, but you know what I mean, constructively. Yeah. Critique, critique, critique. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, because again, like we've got some talented writers, talented showrunners, talented actors, directors, et cetera, and everybody in the film industry. So we need to attract more young people to this, you know, to this world. That's the other thing, because, you know, I mean, we've been, on a call about makeup and hair and how Marsha, remember we're on a call about makeup and hair and how actors across this country are, are, are feeling horrible, horrible. Arnold, you can talk about this, you know, and we have to change those things. Those things must change because the future uh, it's the present. Now the future, if it's going to be brighter, we have to change all those things. It's an ecosystem, the entire, so the future only looks bright if the ecosystem as a whole changes changes for sure and huda i just say that even like with jabari and this sort of uh, you know you mentioned jam and the streamers and what i do find is that that it's like yeah it's it's less investment it's it's um a smaller sort of you know pocket of stuff so if you're going to treat it like a training ground for me the question for someone like jabari who's who's now has a successful sort of piece who's behind him to actually move to the next level Who's getting behind him to say, listen, this is amazing. I want to see what you can do in our space or in with the big boys and get you off of that. Like, you know, like graduate into that sort of space, because I think, you know, it's always great to exercise. It's like, you know, this medium is, 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 is like, like, you just got to do it to get better. You don't, you don't just get better reading about it. And so, so, so they need to be exercising themselves. And then the streamers can really be helping with, 
with with building those sort of programs that allows like you know uh, the next wave of young talent to come through and do their half hours. You know, if they choose to stay in that space, that's cool. But if they want to graduate into into um, doing one hours or feature or longer or series, like so they can actually train because you know. It, all, it often comes down to like, you know, who's approvable, who's qualified, how much experience you have, like you've never done it before. So how do you get to do it? You see all these other folks get like multiple opportunities and, and fail <laughs> and still get another one. And we get like one shot. Yeah. You know? And, 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 and that's also so deeply in, in, in embedded into the DNA of the structure of the way things are made here. It's like, you know, of course, you know, coming to this project to Porter and I, you know, it was, didn't like that it was like, oh, advertising about black show and big and all the writers were, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yes, that's a fact, but like, I, I like in my heart, am I in quietly like, yeah, I celebrate that. We got to all come together and do this, but to kind of wave a flag for other individuals now to kind of use yeah. it as a sort of thing of look what we've accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> is actually so not accurate and but at the same time it's like you know you put a few of us together to make something and we'll do a damn good job you know and there was this also this killing of the noise of 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 trying to be like you know oh all the weight is just on this one project because if we fail They'll never want to make another period show again. Like these sort of things that go through our systems that I know that, you know, I don't think the folks who were making and with an E not calling it out, but they didn't go in like, damn, if we fail, we'll never get another job. Like they weren't saying that, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's, it's like, like how, and, 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 and it's taking a friend of mine to say, listen, Charles, there comes a point where you've got to actually say, you know, like you're, you're here. Like, you, you know, you shouldn't be walking to jobs with a certain amount of spirit experience or ex thinking that like, wow, I really only have one shot here, you know? Um, and so it's, it's just an interesting um, psychology that, that also plays into it. But I think that if they're re if, if this ecosystem about getting behind talent, like, it's just like in sport, you know, you, you, you know, you have different levels of, of, you know, you have junior hockey players, they move to the minor pros, and sometimes they got to stay in the minor pros for a few years before they can move up and play in the professional. So the, but someone who's actually seeing an, an eye on the talent and be like, and in that investment, and we're doing that. And like Jennifer's saying, but there's so many when, when you and folks come by, it can get overwhelming because you can only have so much you can give. And there's so few of us who they're, they, they have options to go to. And, um, and, and, and so it's, uh, yeah, the whole e ecosystem's gotta, gotta shift because we've, we, we have incredibly talented people who can handle many, many facets that exist in this industry. And um, yeah, I really think that- we I wanna give props to Charles. I wanna give props to Charles because as, as he says that, you know, our DOP, Jordan Oran is like, <laughs> A, a young cat and uh, Charles could have gone with more of a senior DOP or whatever it may be because he had never done television, but you know, Charles stood by his word and, 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 and brought Jordan in. And to be honest with you, I often think of him as the star of the show <laughs> because the show looks so beautiful. And here's a guy that, you know, this guy's skyrocketing, man. And I think the things that he did with the show were amazing. And on the other end of that, I think of just going back to Vancouver again and having the chance to, to uh, speak with um, the, the director and producer of The Road Taken, you know, Sawan uh, Jacob. And when I told him that I was embarking on, on telling the this, this story of the Porter in the sense of uh, doing a, a TV series, you could see him welling up and you could feel the weight of him of like the amount of times he probably heard, no, this is crazy. This is ludicrous. What do you think you're doing? Just do this, just do that. Just make it a, 
you know, um, um, a heritage moment, you know, all these things, you could, you could feel it from him. And um, it, uh, that's a tough thing to, to see in, in someone as systematically, I saw that this man had been broken by, by this in the sense of going after his dream. So um, this also too, I think our show is a love letter to not only the descendants of the porters and the voices that we always say that have no voice anymore, but also to the creators uh, that didn't get a chance to uh, spread their wings. Um, mm. as, uh, like a, someone like uh, uh, Mr. Jacob, you know? That's what I believe the show is and the documentary. It, it's so surreal. Here we are sitting down talking on this thing. But to me, I wish we could do this more frequently, man. It really empowers us. Mm -hmm. you, know? you know, you know, I, I do want Arnold, you are always so eloquent in terms of just summar summarizing so what the thing really is, like naming the thing. And um one of the, you know, we're at a place where. I was told, for example, something like, oh, we have, we're not doing any more black historical things or, or we're not really, you know, there's a, there's the porters coming. Um, so we don't need more period. And, and this is not me, it's not a thing about me pitching because I have fun and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm actually pretty resourceful about that sort of stuff. But the idea though, for me, it's the idea, the idea that making one drama about you know black history means that we've told the story it's so insane to me and so this is the thing i and i have to I, why it's insane to me is because i look at all of the bbc and all the british historical dramas mm. and I looked at some of the canadian historical dramas so now that we're getting an opportunity why is it this idea that we don't also want to start from some of the source? We don't want, like, why should we be limited in our storytelling so we can only tell funky, young, new things? Now, I love funky, young, new because I have three of them in my house, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so don't get me wrong. I'm all about the funky, new, young. But I'm just saying it's that we are in a space where we, we have to fight for all the kinds of stories we want to tell. And a part of this wave that's happening is about us saying, no, 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 you need to give us an opportunity to tell all of our stories. You know, the people who didn't get a chance to, to get those stories out in the first place, you know, here's someone else that has, that can bring that in. Let's bring it, let's get it out there. So I just, I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, we have to also fight about um, this space they want to place us in too. Because we're black, we're considered urban. We're considered cool. Let's face it, let's, let's be real here. You know, so that's some of the spaces they want to tuck us. But I think we got to make sure that we land where we want to land, the kinds of stories we believe in. And so I think that's a part of what the future looks like as well. It's actually us actually being firm in that, okay, you know what? No, I actually want to go back and, and tell the story of Sam Langford or, you know, uh, you, you know what I mean? Because, because those stories, uh, you know, I know because we were involved in, in a story around him and they never went anywhere because they're like, well, is he really that important? You know, so it's, it's, so it's like um, we have to fight for um, that as well. You know, the kinds of stories you want to get out there, you know, and not be um, restricted. I, I think now, if I was an executive in that position and you came and you were pitching me that story about Sam Langford, I would definitely green light that project. <laughs> I, I think we'll, if we get to a place, let's go, Charles. Let's go, man. <laughs> if we get to a place where we can do Anne with an E and Anne of Green Gables and the Rotor Avenue, like over and over and over again, like you know, certain people have done. Like that is a place to get to with Porter One, Porter Two, Porter Three. Like if we can get to a place where we're telling our stories with that kind of frequency and and and, and regularity, and the fact that there's an appetite for it, people are watching these stories. That's the place that we want to get to because we want to consume these stories of Black history, but also Black contemporary life, 
in the same in in that way like let's get more stories more stories more stories that's where we need to get to yeah so alia uh, who's part of ontario black history um society has a comment for you all i believe she's typing it or did you want to come on audio oh it's, it's I, I will come on audio because it is long it is three parts if that's okay <laughs> Okay, so to start in terms of Black on History Channel, I'm very grateful that History Channel is finally having like historically accurate Black Canadian history and heritage, um, not only being reported, but has the opportunity to be preserved. Because I know when I was younger, I used to binge watch History Channel. And it's all about like, you know, Egypt, the American Revolution, and like slavery. But the only thing that they talked about was Black history was Egypt. So I'm happy to see that that void is being filled and I hope it continues to be filled. Um, in terms of the Porter, I'm very excited for that. It is good to see a period piece that also incorporates entertainment because it is filmed in drama, in a drama dramatical sense. That's good. And I hope it also will inspire people to look further into the importance of Porters, but also the other roles that Black Canadians did play throughout history that are too often ignored. And it's not just slavery. That's what I do really appreciate about the Porters is like we move beyond that. And I feel like a lot of the time, especially when it comes to black history, we only wanna start with slavery, but we didn't come from that. Our heritage is, is diverse, it's long, it's thick, and it deserves more respect than just to say we were enslaved people, even though we have come so far. And for subjects of desire, I had the opportunity to watch it last week. And I will say it is very heartwarming. I feel like it accurately portrays the reality that Black girls face all over the world, um, especially when you are in a Eurocentric and white dominant um, nation. Like this portrays a conversation that I have had and I know my friends have had amongst each other. So it is very well put together. And I think that is something most people should watch with their families. So each and every one of you, I'm honored to be here today. I appreciate all your effort and all your time. And please, I know like if you want to go to the States, it was a Kind of brought up but please like we need you here in canada i just want to say that oh that's lovely thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you so much i don't want to go to the states i want to stay in canada so you know <laughs> we chose to stay i mean we we, we had children but we which helped that decision but we chose to stay and we i say this you know i have this incredible love for canada i when i go away no matter where Europe, you know, um, South America, you know, Africa, uh, Asia, I am always so happy to land back into Toronto, into my home. It is, it is my home. And I love this country. I really do. I just want to be a part of the conversation of of expanding our understanding of what a Canadian looks like and what our stories are and why, you know, we, um, we matter in a significant way, not in a periphery way. Our voices are key in terms, for me, for, for us to move forward as a community, as a society, as a nation. So I don't know, that's, that's my thoughts about it. Canada and, and but you love it so you want it to be better right like so that you, we want the things we love to be better and we we put our efforts into that and it's like there's this Italian play uh director and artist and he's amazing I had the privilege of seeing him on on these tours and he has like 13 kids and he put all his kids in his in in his plays and he and he'd be doing the sound and directing and his wife is there and he'd always go home he'd go all around the world and always go home to the small little town in Italy and he said to me and his in his, I don't know, whatever, uh, that you, wherever you're born as an artist, you have the responsibility to give something back to that place, no matter where you are, where, where you come from. And I've always believed that and you give something back, you know, especially as an artist, when that is kind of the mode that we're, 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 we're trying to present offerings, you know? Um, and so, so that I believe in that. And that's why I've Want to tell Toronto stories is is even as, as as deep as that. Like you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm. Lovely. We see you, Natasha. <laughs> <laughs> you know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess from. I, from here, I, I think I would want to give you the opportunity as we close, 
for each of you to give the premiere inf premiering information for your uh, production. So if you could just give the date and channel so that people can tune in. And of course, we'll share it on social media as well. Get it, Arnold. Arnold's good at it. Sometimes he'll just get it right into the, just flow it from the question and just get it right in. But now you're getting the spotlight. So <laughs> tell, tell the people what they need to know. Hey, <laughs> February the 21st at uh, nine o'clock Eastern time on CBC, CBC Gem. Um, tune in to watch um, all of our hard work. And like I said before, our love letter to, uh, to Canada. Excellent. No, oh, February 21st, 9 p.m. We will watch. We'll be there watching. Um, for BLK, an origin story, February 26th at 9 p.m. Um, it is a Saturday night, 9 p.m. on history. The following week, we will be on Global um, with Nova Scotia. That's our first. Uh, and so directed by Jennifer Holness. Um, right. After that, we have Montreal. The next week, it'll be Montreal, directed by Matt, Maya Anik Better. And then after that, it will be British Columbia, directed by co-directed by the two of us. And then after following that, rounding out uh, will be Ontario, uh, feature, featuring the president of Ontario Black History Society. But directed by Sud Sutherland. <laughs> but the president of Ontario Black History Society, Natasha Henry, is in that, and she's brilliant. You got to see this. Uh, she's all over Upper Canada slash Ontario. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's uh, four weeks. Uh, and then just I want to say that for Subjects of Desire, which I think mm -hmm. I've seen, I've seen um, it is on TVO. Um, and I, I believe I've actually had three airing on CBC, on, on TVO, including this past Saturday and Sunday. So now it's actually available like on uh, TVO app. App, yeah. And, like, and on YouTube, yeah. TVO's YouTube, TVO's YouTube. And so Apple, you can see it. And Apple TV. And Apple TV. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Uh, but it will be on Stars in the United States for your cousins in the United States. Ooh. On the 22nd. Of, uh, of February. So we're very, I'm very excited about that as well. So. Wow, lots of viewing as I distract myself from uh, completing my dissertation, but <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. I wanted to thank all of you for participating. And just as I'm just hearing you speak and I'm just absorbing what you're saying, and I mean, we could go on for so much longer. A quote came to mind um, a quote from Barbara Christian, and she was an author and scholar, African-American author and scholar. And she said that for people of color, and when she wrote this meant black people, um, always theorized, but in forms quite different from the Western form of abstract logic. And I'm inclined that to say that our theorizing is often in narrative forms, in the stories we create, in riddles and proverbs, in the play with language, because dynamic rather than fixed ideas seem more to our liking. My folk, in other words, we have always been in a race for theory, though more in the form of the hieroglyph, a written figure that is both sensual and abstract, both beautiful and communicative. And I just, that came to mind because of I mean, thinking about the work that you are contributing in terms of us making sense of our sp time and our space in Canada, um, of our things that we, you know, should be doing and are doing in our communities. And, you know, the, the, the work that you are laying out for future generations. I know we have a young up and coming uh, film student who joined us this evening. And so, you know, I just wanted to let you all know Arnold, Suds, Jennifer, Charles, Marsha, that your work is inspiring, that you are, um, you know, just doing amazing things. And so I wanted to really thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. I'm really glad that we were able to come together in this space to talk about all the work and the genealogy that you laid out in terms of Black Canadian film 
is um, is just really amazing. I have to go back and watch this again and and take some notes. Um, you guys are embodying that knowledge and that theory in what you're doing, but you're also putting it and capturing it on film. So thank you so much. And I wanted to thank Huda for moderating. I know Huda has so much to so many questions to ask, and um, just listening to you guys all again has been really great. So thank you once again. We look forward to seeing the. These, um, these films and wishing you all the best for the rest of Black History Month <laughs> and uh, continued through the rest of the year. It's every month, which is every and, month. Black History Month. Three hundred sixty-five days of the year. Well, I, I, I'll do this thing where I call it um, Black Christmas. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I call it Black Christmas. Like, hey, it's Black Christmas, aka. <laughs> You know, Black History Month because you make, know. make sure you take care of yourself. And get to, to the end to the get some rest. <laughs> no. Yes. I do. All right, everyone. Take Thank care. You, Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Jen. All right. All right. Beautiful. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Oh, that was good.